Hello, welcome to Women of Science 2021 at the New York State Museum. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I encourage you to look at other resources that the educators have put on our website, other videos, other content, um, to celebrate the women um, scientists at the New York State Museum. Um, and thank you for joining us today. You're welcome to uh, ask any questions um, online through this live presentation and we'll try to address them through the, my discussion. Or in some, some more general ones, we can save to the end. So I am Dr. Denise Mayer. I'm a scientist at the New York State Museum, and I manage the malacology collection. So what is malacology? As a malacologist, I study the mollusks, which are a large group of animals um, that include things like snails, which are single-shelled animals, um, and clams, which have two shells. Um, but these are animals, so often we're, I'm just holding up shells here, which neglects the fact that there's actually an animal that lives inside that shell. So mollusks are a soft-bodied animal that produces a shell with a special organ called a mantle, um, and it exudes the materials to produce the shell material. So it's things like the marine uh, snails and bivalves, and even octopus and squid are mollusks. So most of these the diversity of over 100,000 species, which is the second most diverse phylum in the animal kingdom, next to the arthropods, which include the insects. So among these mollusks that mostly live and originally evolved in marine systems, oceans, there's a group of animals that evolved in freshwaters. So we have mussels and snails that um, live in freshwater as well. And the group of animals that I study are the freshwater mussels, which are also referred to as clams sometimes. So this is a freshwater mussel. It's kind of drab looking on the outside, maybe not as exciting as some of the marine counterparts that you find on the beach. Um, but these are hard shelled, two shells, um, and they often have this beautiful interior. Um, but these live in the, the mud of our rivers and lakes in New York. And in New York, we have like about 40 species of mussels. So you can see quite the diversity here. If you look at this, this tray, we can see um, some that have stripes, like this one, have these special rays. We call them rays across the shell. I mean, they have an oval shape, kind of a rounded shape. And they're kind of chunky, they're inflated in the shell. So we can kind of see what species they are based on things like, like shape. Here's a sand shell that has a more elongated shape. You can see that it's, that it's longer than it is deep. And it's got a beautiful color inside on that mother of pearl that we call the nacre. Another interesting thing about mussels um, is that they have, on the inside of their shell, which often we can't use to identify species if we're looking at live animals, um, because the mussel will not live apart from its shell. So if you're looking at the interior of the shell, it's an empty shell that you picked up on the shore. So this mussel, this is a pink heel splitter. So you can see that the, the heel splitter comes from this dorsal fin on the outside of the shell. Um, and then on the inside, it's got this beautiful pink nacre. Um, but if you look closely in here, you see these protrusions that we call these hinge teeth. So this is the hinge on the muscle where the shells open and close. And these teeth kind of come together to hold the shell in place. So the presence size and orientation of those teeth can be used to identify different mussel species. So as I said, these mussels live in the bottoms of our lakes and rivers. So it can be really mucky down there. Um, and so the places where I have to go in order to observe and collect some of these specimens can end up having me kind of coming out of the water like a 
a green monster covered in seaweed. So um, that can be kind of one of the uh, fun parts of the job um, <laughs> coming, but you have to kind of get, get over that feeling of, of what might be creepy crawly and, and living on you. Um, so, but why are we even interested? So why do I study freshwater mussels? Well, they're very important in our lakes and rivers. They can be very abundant. There's areas where there can be um, hundreds of mussels in an area the size of this table that I'm standing in front of. But, um, so, and they serve a function. They're, they're filtering the water. Um, if you ever had an aquarium um, to hold fish, you know that there are things that you have to do to prepare that system before the fish go in. You have to add aeration, you add gravel, you might add some seaweed, and very often you need to add a filter to the outside of that tank. Mussels, freshwater mussels, act as that filter in our lakes and rivers. They're a very key component to the ecosystem, locking up nutrients from the water column and then providing that to other animals that live among them in the sediments. Another thing that they do is they till the soil by um, using that foot to dig into the sediment and then move around through the sediment, drag themselves, and they only move maybe a few yards, maybe in their whole life. Some mussels move a little more, some move less, but they're not moving around a whole lot. But when they do, they dig around in the sediment. So just like in the spring, when you till the soil of your garden in preparation for the, the plants that you're gonna plant, mussels are out there doing the same thing. They also serve as food sources for things like otters and mink um, and things like that. So one of the really cool things about mussels, um, and this is uh, one of those things that you might share at the dinner table with your family, a new fact that you learned today. So they've evolved this really neat trait. Marine animals that were the original mollusks, when they reproduce, will release their young into the water column. And they're in the ocean where there's all these currents that are mixing and, and spreading those young all over in the ocean. Um, so, and that's called dispersal, when a parent will spread their young away from them. And that's very important for a population to be able to disperse. But freshwater mussels evolved in rivers. And what is the flow like in a river? It's in one direction, right? So as the mussel releases its young and the river's flowing in one direction, all those young are gonna get washed downstream unless they use this really cool technique and they attach their young to fish. So there's this organ on the, um, this part of the shell, the posterior part of the shell where the siphons are that has evolved to mimic the minnow, the bait fish, of the target fish that they want to use as their host. And I have a little video here that shows a lampsilis, and it's doing exactly this to attract a bass. So if you see it here, you can see that, that little minnow looking twitching. The muscle will twitch. And the muscle doesn't have eyes. It doesn't know that it's doing this. It just, it twitches and is able to attract the fish. And if the fish comes close enough and bonks into where those larvae are, the muscle will release those larvae. Here we'll see, will they bonk into there? Yep, there they go. They release the larvae and those larvae clamp shut very quickly, like a spring loaded, um, vice and they clamp onto the gills and fins of the fish. Now they'll get some nutrition from the fish, it doesn't hurt the fish, and the fish will swim around. It'll even swim upstream to disperse these young and they'll be on the fish for a few weeks, maybe a month, until they grow large enough and then they'll drop off and land in the sediment and develop a new home um, wherever they land. Um, but that's a really neat way of dispersal that the mussels have. So one of the important things then um, is if we do things in a stream that prevent the interaction of fish and mussels, 
we can prevent muscles from being able, able to produce, which isn't a good thing. We want to maintain those connections. Um, like if we put a dam in a river and we separate fish from the mussels, those mussels may never be able to produce, or a culvert that doesn't allow fish pack, pack passage. And we may not know that these mussels even even been impacted, because it's not going to kill them directly. It's going to prevent them from reproducing. And that effect we may not see for many years, even decades, because these animals are very long-lived. This mussel can live for, depending on the species, from 5 to 50, sometimes 100, and even 200 years. And they're not reproductively active until later in life. So it can take a long time to see those impacts. How do you know how old this muscle is? Well, this muscle, this is elliptio, it's got a very dark periostracum, this outer part of the shell. But if you've ever cross-sectioned a tree and then looked at the rings in the tree, you can, it's the same thing that we can do with a muscle, that it lays down um, slower, the shell slower during the winter time when there isn't as much food. So we can see these increments each year that the muscle lays down shells. This one is very difficult to see because it's dark. But here's a lampsilis that is easier to see. So on the external part of the shell, we can see that there's these growth lines. And each one of these is laid down each year. But now, mussels don't just continue to grow in size throughout their life. There's a limit. So each mussel will maybe reach, depending on the species, maybe a few inches. But their shell is still growing. They're still laying down that shell material. But at this part of the shell where it lays down the material, they'll be very tight and close together, which makes it almost impossible to be able to age the shell. So we, take, we have a technique where we can cross-section the shell. We can split that. We can cut the shell and take a very thin piece of the shell and then put it on a slide. And then that slide we can look at under a microscope and we can learn to identify those growth annuli. So in this slide here, you can see the umbo on the one part of the shell. And, there's, and we've got the picture of the external where we can see the, the rings. This is the same muscle shell. Um, in the top picture is the external lines that we're depicting. And then here's the, under the microscope, the growth rings from that section. And you can see this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old muscle. Um, so that's how we age a muscle shell. Um, so some of the projects that I get to work on. So one of the, the joys of working at the New York State Museum is that as a scientist, I get to do programs like this. I get to do education. I get to work on exhibits. I get to preserve specimens for collections. And I also get to do research. And part of that research is collecting specimens, doing surveys, and looking at what's the diversity of this group of animals in New York State. And so there's a couple of projects I've been specializing in. And one is the Hudson River, um, where there was a few years ago uh, a large project to remediate a section of the river between Troy and Fort Edward and Glens Falls. And in removing those sediments, they removed a lot of mussels. But there were never surveys done to know how many mussels and which mussels even existed in that system. So I worked with uh, partners at the Department of Environmental Conservation. And we've looked at, um, in a quantitative way, looking at a random selection, a grid um, plot of sites in the river, and going to be able to quantify which species and their populations live in the river. And so we put down a grid. You see that white grid there next to the weight. And I go down there as a diver, and I dig up all the mud. Because some of these mussels are so small, they may be an eighth of an inch in length when they're very young and then just dropped off of the fish. Um, but I can collect them in that grid and into the bag. Then we bring them up to shore, sift through those, and do research on the mussels. 
Another project in the northern part of the state is in the Grass River, which is on the uh, St. Lawrence, it empties into the St. Lawrence River. And there the uh, New York State and tribal partners asked for me to help um, on a project to instead of just looking at which, which species and numbers were in the river, before there was remediation in a segment of the river, they wanted to go in and move as many mussels out of the way as possible. So we went in as divers and there's a large team of people. This is always with you know, multiple partners and multiple scientists. We go in and collect as many mussels as possible and they actually hired contractors in the last few years to be able to do this. And they've moved um, as many mussels as possible out of those areas in harm's way. So that's one of the most fun things about working on projects like this is being able to work with other scientists. We all have similar interests and it's all for that greater good of conservation and, and learning. But so, what can you do to protect uh, species, groups of animals like native mussels? So North America has the greatest diversity of freshwater mussels anywhere in the world, of like 300 species originally. But it's also one of the most imperiled groups of animals in the world. 70% of those species are either imperiled, threatened, endangered, or already extinct. And why is that? Why would this group of animals be so affected? Well, think of where they live. They live in rivers and streams, and rivers and streams are the funnel that captures everything that we do in the air and on the land. So everything that we do in our yards, in our fields, on our roads, it washes into these systems, and these animals are very sensitive. They're like the canary in the coal mine that can be an indicator of what we're doing to our planet. So what can you do? You can learn about them. Um, knowledge is power, right? So there, for freshwater mussels, there are great YouTube videos of scientists like me actually in the field, and they're showing you mussels and collecting. It's almost like you're in the river with them. Um, but then anything. Any animal, when you, um, not just mussels, when you go out, outside, you're spending a lot of time outside right now, we all are, um, take a look at things, take a close look. The closer you look at animals, the more you look at the details that you can observe, um, the more questions you have to ask. And it's those questions that are your curiosity, and those are the things that drive helping animals like this and any animal um, to to maintain their conservation. So I thank you for tuning in today, and I hope to see you someday soon at the museum. <laughs>